Hi there, I'm Corey Brown Swan, and this lecture will focus on the question, should we stay or should we go? Looking at the referendum experience of Scotland and the UK since the 1970s. I'm a research fellow at the Centre on Constitutional Change, where I look at intergovernmental dynamics and party politics. When we think about Scotland and its referendum experience, we can think about Scotland as a member of, of multiple unions in the UK as well. So Scotland within the United Kingdom and the United Kingdom within the European Union. Questions of unions are considered big constitutional issues. And there's a tendency to attempt to solve these questions or answer these questions by asking people what they think in a referendum. But what I'd like you to consider as we move through this lecture is a referendum's the best way of solving these questions, which are often quite contentious, quite divisive, or is there an alternative mode of decision making? So we'll look at five referendums in turn. We're focusing on the Scotland Scottish experience here, but of course there were referendums in Wales as well in 1979 and 1997. So 1990, 1975 saw the in-out referendum on membership of the EEC, the Econo European Economic Community, which later became the European Union. Just four years later, there was a referendum on Scottish and Welsh devolution. And in 1997, again, another referendum on Scottish and Welsh devolution. The 1997 referendum was, of course, unsuccessful, while the 1997 referendum succeeded. In 2014, there was a referendum on Scottish independence, followed just two years later by an out referendum on membership of the European Union. We'll move on now to the, the first referendum. The referendum took place in 1975, and you, voters in the UK were asked, do you think the, the United Kingdom should stay in the European community, the common market? How did we get here? The relationship between the, the UK and the nascent European project had always been quite a difficult one. The UK had applied for membership in the European Economic Community in 1961 and 1967, but their application was vetoed by the French. In 1973, the UK finally joined the EEC under a Conservative government, and Labour, who came to power in 1974, proposed a referendum on continued membership, having negotiated a new deal. This deal focused on, on economic issues, and the EEC at the time was primarily an economic organisation, um, particularly on food, food imports, contributions to common, common market budgets, and industrial policy. You'll see the, anti, the National Anti-EEC Committee issued an ad saying, save your jobs, suggesting that this EEC membership led to foreign competition, um, led to economic downturn. Harold Wilson said that we believe this be these better terms could give Britain a new deal in Europe that would help us, help the Commonwealth, and help our partners. Uh, there was a focus on foods, imports, jobs and relationships with the Commonwealth, but all of the parties in this period were quite divided. This would include the statewide parties, Conservatives and Labour, and sub-state nationalist parties. You can see these two ads which carry two different messages, an anti-EEC ad, which is out and into the world, suggesting that EEC membership was too narrow. And yes, Britain is where she belongs in Europe, um, focusing on the need to build bridges rather than barriers at this time. And here's two important campaign ads. We see this the Yes campaign or a campaign to remain within the EEC, focusing on community help and the benefits of EEC membership. And quite nitty gritty practical things here. Um, the influence of food prices, um, food subsidies, and the ability to, to reduce costs for the everyday family. The no campaign was a bit more emotive, or the campaign to leave the EEC was more emotive. Where lies your heart, in Britain or in Brussels? The referendum entering the EEC was to, to end a thousand years of British freedom and independent nationhood. This was considered an unheard of constitutional change. Is Britain to be a great nation or merely a province of the EEC? Do you want us to be a self-governing nation or to be a province? Do we want to be a small partner in a potentially communist customs union? Um, do we want to dishonor our dead who fought for our freedom and should we forsake our family ties and tradition? So we can see quite a mode of language around EEC membership here. Some of the same issues as 2016, the idea of sovereignty, who makes decisions, who makes control or who controls things, um, but also how does the UK interact with the rest of the world? 
um, the final sentence says, do we want to merge with France, Germany, and Italy with their communist parties? Um, do we want to exercise individual influence as a nation? When we look to Scotland, there was a, a conflictual position or a difficult position for the SNP to take. It was divided on the issue, ultimately campaigned for a no vote, but its opposition was very much contingent. It was no on anybody else's terms, suggesting that if an independent Scotland were to negotiate its own terms with the EEC, its position may change. And we see the contingency of this position on the basis that it shifted in the 1980s, becoming a, a very pro-European Union party. 68% voted in, in favor of continued membership, but we see lower support on a territorial basis. Only 58% in favor in Scotland and Northern Ireland, 52%. So all of the, the nations and regions of the United Kingdom supported staying within the EEC, but differing levels of support. This, this vote didn't solve the Europe question. There, were Euro, there was Euro skepticism within the main parties. Thatcher said no, no, no to further integration and deepening of the European community. And the SNP's position changed over time to become more pro-European. In 1979, Scots returned to the polls to vote on a referendum on devolution. Do you want the provisions of the, the Scotland Act 1978 to be put into effect, they were asked. How did this referendum come about? Throughout the 1970s, we saw growing support for the SNP, culminating in the October 1974 election, in which the SNP won a record 11 seats. In response to a perceived nationalist threat, conservatives and labor officials developed devolution proposals to counter the, the claims made by the nationalists. The Labour government proposed a Scottish Assembly with competencies over education, environment, health and home affairs, and legal matters and social services. However, there are deep divides within the Labour Party over the feasibility of this proposal. And then the Act was eventually amended to allow the repeal if 40% of the population did not vote yes. So it wasn't a 50% plus one vote, just a simple majority vote. It required a super majority um, in order to pass. The 1979 campaign reflected deep divides within all of the parties, and the campaign was a bit half-hearted. For Labour and Conservatives and Liberals, there were concerns about the level of powers. They were too great, they were too strong, they would cause conflict, and they would undermine Westminster. For Nationalists, they saw these, the Assembly as, as too weak, insufficiently powerful, and falling far short, far short of their goal of independence. However, there were some within the party who saw it as a prospect the prospect of devolution as a stepping stone to independence. We can see this in the two campaigns, two campaign dynamics. On the left, we see an image from the labor movement, the Get Labor Yes campaign, saying we fought hard for a Scottish assembly. It will create the Scot Scotland of the future that you want. It will ensure that purely Scottish issues are decided here in Scotland, and it will strengthen democratic control. In addition, it will preserve the economic and political unity of the United Kingdom. It was designed to undercut the appeal um, that the SNP had within the electorate. The Scotland Said No campaign was which much more negative, saying this referendum is dangerous and consistently stressing this danger, danger of conflict, danger of indecision, danger of exeter taxation, danger of loss of power in Westminster and the breakup of Britain, a warning people to vote now. Overall, we saw a vote in favor, 51.6%, but devolution fail, failed because less than 40% of the total electoral electorate voted yes. The Labour government f fell as a result, um, and we see a shift in Scottish society and Scottish politics, a growing opposition to the Conservative government in the 1980s, and mobilization around economic and social issues, with growing support for self-government, not necessarily independence, but some sort of devolution for Scotland, which brings us to our third referendum. In 1997, voters were asked, do you agree that there should be a Scottish Parliament as proposed by the government? Throughout the 1980s, we saw wider engagement with the idea of self Scottish self-government, with the Scottish Constitutional Convention con being convened during this period and the claim of right for Scotland issued, which asserted the right for Scotland to decide its own future. 
Labour ran in 1997 on a pledge to hold a referendum on devolution in both Scotland and Wales. It was a two-question referendum in Scotland on Parliament and on the tax varying powers of that Parliament. By 1997, there was a broad consensus amongst the main parties, Labour, the SNP and the Liberal Democrats, in favour of a devolved Parliament. The Conservatives campaigned against the measure. The SNP had, had largely adopted a gradualist approach. The Parliament was weak and they criticised it for being insufficient, but it could be built upon. The campaign focused on potential of the Parliament to allow for decisions to be taken closer to Scotland. The Yes campaign focused on the a Yes Yes motion. Yes, we should have a referendum, and yes, that, we should have a Parliament, and the Yes, that Parliament should have tax varying powers. The Conservatives and the No campaign focused on the cost, the cost of an assembly, the cost of the building, and the cost of devolution, the duplication and the inefficiencies of devolution. 74% of people voted in favour of a Scottish Parliament and 63.5% voted in favour of giving this Parliament tax voting powers. Elections were held for the first Scottish Parliament in 1999 and there was an electoral system, a mixed member system, which was designed to encourage coalition governments. In 2014, voters in Scotland were asked, should Scotland be an independent country? We see, since devolution, a change in voting patterns in Scotland, with the success of the SNP from 2007 onward, and a growing desire amongst, the, amongst citizens for something more than devolution, often falling short of independence, but some sort of extended devolution. The SNP formed a government in 2007, and so it stressed performance politics, its achievements as a party of government, rather than its desire for independence. However, when it formed a majority government following the 2011 election, it had a mandate to have an independence referendum. And the UK government accepted this mandate. And David Cameron and Alex Salmond signed the Edinburgh Agreement, setting out the terms of the independence referendum to be held in 2014. The campaign was organised around two main campaigns. Yes, Scotland, including the SNP and the Greens, and Better Together, including Labour, Liberal Democrats, and Conservatives. However, there was significant grassroots mobilisation on the Yes side, outside of the formal Yes Scotland campaign. In 2014, for the first time, this campaign was very much a social media campaign, with activists engaging on Twitter, on Facebook, to win people over to their cause. What were some of the key issues? We see economic issues, how rich or how poor would Scotland be as a result of independence? What would be the economic impacts, not just for the country as a whole, um, but for individual families? The currency question, what currency would Scotland use? Would it be able to retain the pound or would it need a new independent currency? And that was closely related with EU membership. Would Scotland be able to remain a member of the European Union or would it need to reapply and accept thing, certain things like the Euro and Schengen? Social welfare, um, which was quite salient after, in the period of austerity. Defence, would Scotland be, be a contributor to NATO? And how would the assets and responsibilities of the UK and Scotland be divided? Over the campaign period, we see a narrowing gap between yes and no. And in response to a poll just a few days before the vote, unionist parties pledged to, to transfer further powers to Scotland. This took the form of a vow. If, Scot if voters voted no, there would be a process by which devolution would be extended. You can see two campaign images here, one quite a practical, one from Better Together, which used the tagline, no thanks, um, focusing on the cost, the everyday cost of independence. Um, and another campaign, and both of these were used in social media campaigns, focusing on austerity, let's become independent before 100,000 more children are living in poverty. Both campaigns stress future. They stress personal connection as well as, as cost and consequences. The Yes campaign on the left suggests that Scotland's future rests in Scotland's hands, that this was a decision taken for future generations. And the Better Together campaigns came up with quite similar messaging. I love Scotland. I'm saying no thanks. We love our kids. We're saying no thanks. There were also campaign messages or campaign posters and, and 
advertisements which stressed risk on the no side, stressing the risks and the consequences of independence, and on the yes side, suggesting the potential of independence, both economic and social. The result of the referendum was much narrower than anticipated, with 45% of voters voting yes, 55% voting no. As a result, the Smith Com Commission convened to fulfil the vow, a cross-party agreement on further powers for Scotland. We also saw an interesting electoral di dynamic. In many ways, the SNP snatched victory from the jaws of defeat. The party saw an, an enormous increase in membership and success of the 2015 Westminster elections, winning 56 out of 59 of the Scottish seats. It opened up questions over whether the independence issue was settled for a generation or, as would become the motto of the 2016 election, whether there could be a material change in circumstances which would provoke or provide justification for another referendum. This brings us to our fifth and final referendum, which took place in 2016. Voters in the United Kingdom were asked, should the United Kingdom remain a member of the European Union or leave the European Union? How did this come about? We see growing Euroscepticism within the Conservative Party, particularly the position of Eurosceptic backbenchers and the growing electoral threat of UKIP. Cameron promised in the 2015 a renegotiation and a referendum if a majority government was formed, which polling at the time suggested was unlikely. However, in 2015, we see a shift in electoral politics in the UK. We see a conservative victory in 2015 in England, and you can see that in the shift from red to blue on the map to the right, but Scotland turned yellow, again with the SNP returning 56 of 59 seats. The campaign focused on the economy, access to sing the single market, and control over immigration. And we see these disputed knowledge claims as defining or definitive of the campaign. How much does the UK contribute to the EU budget? Is it 350 million, as it said on the famous red bus? Or is it something less? And what does the UK get back from its membership? What are the ec economic implications of leaving the European Union? Would the British economy experience an economic revival or would it suffer? Immigration, jobs, housing and social welfare were all salient issues. However, in Scotland, the EU was of quite low salience. All parties represented in the Scottish Parliament backed continued EU membership. So we saw less debate about the EU in Scotland. What did the campaigns look like? Campaigns focused on these knowledge claims, but also focused on personalities. We can see a, a Vote Remain campaign focusing on, on Nigel Farage, Boris Johnson and Michael Gove as gamblers, as tricksters, people who can't be trusted with the future of the UK. And a Leave EU campaign which focused on David Cameron as subservient or as overly supportive of the European Union, engaging in propaganda over the values of the European Union. So personalities played a role in the advertisements and in the debates. What happened? We see narrow victory for leave, um, 52% voting to leave, 48% voting for remain. But we see geographical differences throughout the UK, with majorities in favour of leaving in England and in Wales, but Scotland and Northern Ireland voting to remain within the European Union. Shortly after the vote, we see the resignation of Cameron and le Labour and Conservative leadership challenges. The Article 50 was, was invoked, and then in 2017, faced with deadlock within her own party and within Parliament, Theresa May called another election. This resulted in a minority government with the backing of the DUP, the Northern Irish Unionist Party. We see ongoing negotiations with the European Union, May facing leadership challenges from within her own party, and of her eventual resignation. In Scotland, we see a debate over whether this is a material change in circumstances, as the SNP set out in its 2016 manifesto, or as Theresa May famously said, now is not the time for another referendum, another constitutional debate. And that debate has really defined the period from the 2016 referendum onward. Is this a material change in circumstances? Can Scotland have another referendum? Should Scotland have another referendum? Or is it too risky? Will it not win? Or will it distract people from the real issues at hand? So what happens now? 
we'll reflect, and I have more questions than answers here, but we'll reflect on what happens now. What happens with Scotland, Brexit, and the European Union? We've seen perhaps a, a resort or a referendum mania. There were calls to allow us for a second vote on, the, on a Brexit deal, and this was endorsed by the Liberal Democrats. Some of the other parties were more circumspect, and ultimately this failed. And then the idea of the second independence referendum. Brexit is seen as a material change in circumstances. There's a brief Brexit bounce in support for independence, but it's since stabilized with roughly half of the population supporting independence and another half supporting remaining within the United Kingdom. In many ways, Brexit encourages independence or encourages a mobilization around independence, but it also complicates it. And there's been a resistance of the UK government to any transfer of powers to have a referendum. And that was necessary in 2014. David Cameron and Alex Salmond had negotiated that agreement to allow the Scottish Parliament to pass that legislation. What are some of the broader consequences of the UK's referendum mania? We see increased political engagement with referendums returning much higher turnouts than a, than a general election. But it often reduces very complex arrangements to a binary choice. And what next? We have ongoing uncertainty around Brexit, particularly in the era of COVID-19. How will Brexit be negotiated? Ne further negotiations take place. Will they take place and will they take place on that time scale? We see small but significant increases in support for independence and support the SNP doing quite well at the general election in 2019. But the 2014 proposals will require revision due to Brexit. And there are questions about whether Scottish voters will trade the UK for the EU and more broadly throughout the UK, what will happen in Northern Ireland? Do English voters prioritise the Union? And questions about Wales. And we see this indie curious trend um, with increased conversations about Welsh independence or extensions to devolution and ongoing questions about Northern Ireland. Thank you so much. I hope that was helpful and I hope that was enlightening. Um, if you have any questions, you can find me, you can send me an email. I'm always happy to hear from people um, or follow me on Twitter. And I'd like to, to give a plug for the Scottish Political Archive, which maintains this incredible Flickr account, um, which provided the materials and the imagery I use today. So definitely go and have a look through that. Um, but I hope you enjoyed. Thank you.